here with his team who will be noticed and properly recognized a little later on with the moderator. And uh, to my left, we've got the permanent secretary for the Ministry of Tourism in, in Barbados. Um, <laughs> our secretary general has told me that we should say, uh, Hugh, Donna, Donna, you don't, you, you don't come, Billy. Really. Hugh. <laughs> He sort of broke the, 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 the rhythm there, Billy. Yeah, yeah. And so all of you will be recognized later. Owen has, we'll, we'll do that. But we wanted to begin this, just want to give you a quick idea of what it is. We wanted this forum to be something different from what we've done before. In the past, we've just had a panel and we spoke and discussed an exchange and sometimes it got a little heated, sometimes it was kumbaya. But we wanted to focus on culture and heritage this year and the economic impact of culture and heritage. And so we've put together a panel of diaspora leaders who will talk about it and exchange with our Caribbean uh, visitors here. But we also wanted to demonstrate culture and heritage, you see. So you would have noticed in the uh, coming in, there was some art. So true Caribbean culture, heritage, art on display. And, oh, by the way, you know, some of it is for sale, so, you know, feel free to don't let it go back where it came from, let it go home with you later. And we've got some Caribbean t-shirts for the CTO Foundation. Now, I would like to call it a night, shut up, get out of there, go sit in the audience and welcome Owen Clare, who will and Marsha Branch, who will introduce this panel and take it over from here. Owen Clare, put your hands together, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a wonderful Brooklyn evening that we welcome you to. Brooklyn is the center of Caribbean happenings outside of the Caribbean. It's a vibrant place. In fact, it, it has more people in Brooklyn from Caribbean than there are those in the Caribbean. So let's understand that. Ministers of government, please take note. Welcome. And first of all, let me share with you the, 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 the fantastic person that is standing beside me. I happen to be standing on the, the taller side of the podium, that's why I look this way. But in deciding to do this, the, the decision was taken that it's now high time that folks like myself who are becoming relics start step aside and, and allow persons who are more <laughs> presentable like the person beside me <laughs> come forth. Because it's important, ladies and gentlemen, in our society that we pave the way and allow for the younger persons in our society to step up to the microphone. Amen. I need another amen on that. Because we're not doing enough of it. All right? And if we are to have sustainability, that is a very integral part of our responsibility right here in, these, in the world we live in. So, ladies and gentlemen, won't you put your hands together as we welcome Ms. Marsha Branch. And in fact, in fact, before I go further, I must tell you that, you know, we were looking at the whole scenario as to how one introduces persons, and I got some bios, and I asked Marsha, you know, it is said that Caribbean nationals normally have 16 jobs. Well, here goes her 16. <laughs> And, it's, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm making it, uh, I'm cutting down on the 16, but she is a correspondent for the Huffington Post. She has done some work with BBC. She's a United Nations correspondent. And that's just three of the 16. So as you can see, she's a mogul that I'm standing beside. So ladies and gentlemen, one more time for Ms. Marshall. Thank you very much, Erwin. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here today. I want to say thank you very much to Johnson, who invited me here today to co-moderate this event. Um, Erwin made a passing joke about my height, but I just want you to know, Erwin, that I am sharp and sweet, just like the Caribbean islands that are small and sweet. Okay, so good things come in small packages. And the Caribbean is a testament to that. So I'm really pleased to be here today and I'm looking out at all these beautiful Caribbean faces because where I'm staying, there aren't many of you. So I'm glad to be among you. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you later and having you play a part 
in the events here tonight and share your thoughts on how we can really maximize um, the Caribbean and, and its potential. All right. Well, before we get started, there's a very important gentleman here. Um, I noticed that that Johnson made a, a, a joke of him being part of that grouping that was introduced earlier. But I must also tell you before I bring him to stage that today is World Environment Day. And in fact, there's a message that our Secretary General um, did um, put out today. But ladies and gentlemen, won't you please help me as I introduce to the stage Mr. Hugh Riley, who has been at this this juncture in the whole aspect of tourism presentation for quite some time. And we'd like to welcome Mr. Hugh Riley, Secretary General of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, to come forth and say a few words. Thank you very much, Irvin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to be here this evening, and I'd like to um, recognize the Minister of Tourism, the Honorable Dominic Fiddy from St. Lucia, his uh, consultant and tourism expert, Agnes Francis, also from St. Lucia, Vice Consul for St. Lucia, I believe as well, thank you. Over here, we've got Mr. Billy Griffith, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated. Next to him is Donna Kadakin, who is the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism for Barbados. Dr. Donna Hunt-Cox is the Consul General for Barbados at New York. Mr. Hugh Foster is himself a tourism practitioner of many years uh, vintage and a public relations consultant with the Ministry of Tourism for Barbados as well. And, and he's the only one with a fan in the audience. How about that? Please applaud. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take your card later, man, because you're the, you're the first person who's ever applauded you, Foster, in any audience that I've been at. Uh, we've, got, we've got Dr. Kerry Hall, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Barbados Tourism Product uh, Authority here. I, I am, I'm almost certain to have missed somebody that I should have recognized. Please forgive me uh, if, I, if I have. My name is Hugh Riley. It's a pleasure to, to welcome you here. My words are very, very short. We need really just to say a couple of things. The Caribbean diaspora is the nucleus, the heart of what the Caribbean is overseas. There is nothing more important than going to a strange land and flying your flag and telling people to come back and break bread and share space with us in the Caribbean. So we really always appreciate it when you come with us, you come among us, and, 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 and we hope that you will take back with you some of the information that you will now share with people within your sphere of influence because we need to have them and you back to the Caribbean. And then the final thing that I'll say is this, uh, we, we know that you have clearly a reason, many reasons, to go back to the country of your parents' birth or to go back to the country of your birth. That's fine and you go back for a, a myriad of reasons, but also make a pledge if you can this year to go to some other Caribbean country that you haven't visited. So many, many of us have seen the major cities of the world, including this great one, without ever having seen the island that's shouting distance away from where we're from or where our parents were born. Let's change that. The whole Caribbean is ours. The whole Caribbean belongs to us and to our children. Let them go and enjoy the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and, and the English-speaking Caribbean like they've never seen before. So thank you for your continued support. Thank you for the, the, the knowledge and the experience that you give us in your feedback every day of the year. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. One of the hardest working persons in tourism. Give him another round of applause, please. I must also indicate this that we are in the month of Caribbean American Heritage Month, the month that has been proclaimed where we celebrate the contributions of Caribbean Americans to these United States. This is the 12th year. We are very proud of that. Let us understand that our presence here helped to impact economically, socially, and politically these United States. We are just a part of these United States as anybody else in this country. Caribbean people need to be proud of that. And as we do so, we understand our responsibility. And our responsibility, if nothing else, is for our children. So, big up yourself. This is Caribbean American Heritage Month. Big up yourself. 
At this point, um, there is a presentation on Barbados, Curry Festa. We're going to ask Mr. Hugh Foster to join us on stage and make the introduction. Mr. Hugh Foster, I just heard <laughs> Mr. Riley says it's the first time we heard anybody introduce you. They clap. Well, clap him again, for him, please. <laughs> so, twice in one evening. Advertisement. <laughs> Well, um, I think they've done all the introduction. We have a promo, a promotional piece on Carrie Festa, 13. We're going to show that right now.
you just viewed promoting the 13th edition of Carfesta in Barbados, 17th to 27th of August, speaks to the showcasing of the cultural industries as a legitimate component of Caribbean economies, their potential and sustainability as an economic sector. Carifesta also denotes the contribution of the development of cultural tourism in the region. The Caribbean Festival of Arts has assumed a preeminent place among the elements that define and give expression to the uniqueness of Caribbean, of our Caribbean reality. It is a significant institution that symbolizes a common Caribbean, a Caribbean commonality, I should say, like cricket, CARICOM, and the University of the West Indies. It was at a regional gathering of artists in Guyana in 1970 that the idea of a Grand Caribbean Festival of Arts was conceived, eight years after the collapse of the West Indies Federation in 1962. By the way, historians describe that four years of federation, a golden opportunity missed. Prime Minister Forrest Burnham of Guyana is credited with spearheading the conversion of the artist's idea into the first Caribbean Festival of Arts in Guyana in 1972. It attracted a thousand artists from 30 countries in the Caribbean and South America. I'm sure the Puerto Ricans were represented there with their planner. The cultural and artistic groundswell generated by the success in 1972 gave impetus to it being institutionalized by CARICOM. CARIFESTA, inter alia, offers a unique opportunity to depict the life of the people of the region, their heroes, morals, myths, traditions, beliefs, creativity, and ways of expression. It provides a forum for the people of the region to be exposed to each other's culture. In the process, cultivates tolerance and appreciation for our differences. The theme of, of Carifesta 13, sorry, in Barbados, 70 to 27 of August, is, as you saw in the, in the promo, assisting our culture, celebrating ourselves. It takes place as a unique Bajan celebration, arguably the biggest and sweetest annual summer festival in the Caribbean, notably crop over. May 14th to Kadumat Day, August 7th, winds down. Carifesta will witness the gathering of 23 Caribbean and Latin American nations, showcasing film, folk traditions, several genres of music, theater, dance, and culinary cuisine, among others. Additionally, there will be super concerts featuring international and regional star performers the Caribbean's first mega mall, dedicated strictly to Caribbean creative products, will be set up. <laughs> Let me repeat that. <laughs> the Caribbean's first mega mall, dedicated to strictly Caribbean creative products, will be set up at Carifesta. International and regional buyers will be there, and so too should be the entire Caribbean diaspora. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you are cordially invited to crop over and Carifesta in Barbados this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. For a moment there, we could almost say the forum is over because what he has just done is to capsule the whole idea of our culture and our heritage. And, and so, Mr. Hugh Foster, thank you very much for that opening because I, I think that really enlightens us as to why we're here this evening. But not only that, to show and demonstrate that we are actually doing things. It's actually real. And Carafest this year, of course, is gonna be awesome in Barbados. So, Send the tickets, I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> All right, we getting ready? Do we? Okay. All right. 
As we prepare for the, our panels, I just want to also acknowledge at this time Mr. Kareem Adin Hassan, who is with the New York State Comptroller, Mr. DiNapoli in Albany. It's always good to have these controller persons around, you know. Where is he? Where are you, sir? Thank you very much for being here, sir. No audits this year, okay? Great. Now, the theme, fulfilling the economic potential of culture and heritage. The Caribbean is recognized as having a vibrant and diverse yet unique heritage and a culture so rich as to be enviable. With culture and heritage contributing an estimated $625 billion to the global economy, the economic potential for the Caribbean is enormous. And with the sizable, well-educated and affluent diaspora, whose large majority is invested and interested in its countries of origin, according to the World Bank, the Caribbean diaspora is well poised to fulfill its potential. The Diaspora Forum will explore how true partnerships can be forged with home, where the opportunities lie for tourism, what members of the diaspora have to offer, and how the true value of the region's culture and heritage can be realized for the members of the diaspora and the Caribbean tourism product. Ladies and gentlemen, we have put together a forum of individuals to talk to us based on their expertise and their ideas as to how we can forge these type of relationships, number one, but at the same time, find ways that we can monetize it. Because for too long now, we have just been mere consumers of the very things that we produce, while others bankroll and make the profits. Do I get an amen? Amen. Right. So the whole idea this afternoon is to discuss with some of our officials who are here so they can hear from you here in the diaspora just where our intention, what our intentions are and the interest that we have to forge these type of relationships. So Marsha, we have some persons here we're going to bring to stage and whom do we have first to introduce on stage as they come up? Okay, I'm just going to share a little bit of information um, about who they are and what they do, and I'm going to leave the rest to them because they can, no one can better describe them than themselves. But Wilson Baptiste, um, he has over 25 years of experience in hotel and tourism, in the hotel industry and tourism, and he has been focused on sustainable tourism development. And Wilson formed Gems of St. Lucia in 2008. And I think that's a significant accomplishment. Um, he's also been involved in projects to um, ensure that we promote sustainable development in the Caribbean, that we protect our natural environment and our coastal waters. And he's taken the Caribbean and its interests as far as Africa. And I, I understand, Wilson, it was in the, at the 40th Congress of the Africa Travel Association in Nairobi, Kenya in November. I would love for you to share some more about that experience and how you um, introduced the Caribbean uh, over there at that event. I think that's very amazing. I want to welcome you on stage. As Wilson makes his trek to the stage, our next panelist is Miss Shelley Warrell, and she's batting second today. I'm only kidding. Warrell, of course, is what? Caribbean. What? Caribbean. Okay, that's good. That's one answer. Warrell again is? Three that is one of them. Thank you. What does that mean? Cricket. Thank you very much. Keep it simple, guys. Come on. <laughs> She's the founder and chief curator of Caribbean, a thriving cultural organization that stands at the crossroads of film and art and culture. Since its founding, Shelley has produced over 200 public programs, reaching over 100,000 attendees. Now, she's one of those persons who is so adept and fully Caribbean that she is not necessarily cosmopolitan. But she's Caribbean, she's Carib politician, I like to call her, no, I'm not kidding. She's more Caribbean than any person in this room because wherever she goes, she speaks and breathes Caribbean. 
and she's all about the culture and our heritage. Put your hands together for Shelley Ward. <laughs> now, the other person, and you know, he provided me, you know, let me tell you, one thing I know about our people here is that when it comes down to representing, and we do it well, but you see, he gave me his bio, but I decided not to. I'm going to speak to him because I know him as this person. Have you ever heard of a one-person conglomerate? I'm going to introduce you to one tonight. Mr. Jerry Hopkins. You should clap for that. Jerry, an attorney, public relations consultant. He hosts, uh, what we say, networking parties. A consummate Caribbean man. A person with a wealth of experience and understanding as to what our Caribbean community is. When he comes up here, of course, you'll know more of him. Put your hands together for Mr. Jerry Hopkins. I also want to let our folks know that this evening's event is made possible because we've had some kind contributions from Grace. Quality since 1922, Tower Isles Patties, and of course our airlines in the sky, Caribbean Airlines. A round of applause for us. I keep forgetting I have my own yeah, mic. Yeah, you have your own mic, my dear. I mean, you're the Huffington, aren't you? Yeah, girl power. <laughs> okay, I want to invite everyone here to get involved in the discussion. You want to take out your smartphones, you want to head to Twitter, you want to head to Instagram, and on Twitter, you want to use the hashtag CWNY2017. So if you want to say something that you think is important, you think it needs to be heard, just hashtag CWNY2017 so that we can see it. And I want to ask you to follow the CTO on Twitter and Instagram, and that's at CTO. Tourism on Twitter and at CTO Tourism on Instagram. And when you share your beautiful photos of the Caribbean, just add that at CTO Tourism so they can see that you are being ambassadors for the Caribbean as well. All right. At this point, I'm going to ask the, our panelists to give a, a brief uh, summation of themselves and of the topic that we're discussing this evening. I'm going to start with um, Mr. Wilson Baptiste. Wilson? Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And we are fortunate that we are having this discussion at this time when there is so much trepidation in the Caribbean with regards to cultural and heritage tourism. However, in order for us to understand and fully address the challenges, we must properly define that segment of the tourism sector. Who owns it? Where are they located? And how can they be used to ele alleviate the level of poverty in certain sectors of Caribbean society? In addition to that, we have to look at the value of cultural and heritage tourism to the global tourism sector. It is a growing sector that, pro that will provide the Caribbean with tremendous potential for growth. However, we have to be able to understand who the cultural tourists are. They are not the regular hotel tourists. They are unique. They are looking for experiences. They want to experience a place. Wake up on mornings and see that they are somewhere. And as a result, this is going to provide the indigenous people in the Caribbean with economic benefits from tourism like they have never felt before. In addition to that now, we have to look at the role of the diaspora in the development of that specific segment. And the roles that we can play is marketing. For instance, we had Gems of the Caribbean where marketing is everybody's business. We do it, but we have to formalize that structure. In the area of investment, some of the cultural heritage tourism assets are owned by indigenous people who do not know the value pr proposition of those assets. And as such, we have to look at ourselves as investing 
in these products to bring about greater benefits to them. And thirdly, in the area of skills transfer, we have to be able to transfer our skills to that segment, thereby ensuring that we maximize the potential of that segment to the Caribbean Thank and its people. Thank you very much, Wilson. Um, you, you mentioned culture of tourism. I'm going to switch to, 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 to Jerry. Talk, talk to us about cultural tourism. What, is it, what does it mean? What is cultural tourism? When we, when we speak of cultural tourism, of course we have to begin with what is culture. Culture, as most of us would know, is the sum of attitudes, customs, and beliefs that distinguishes one group of people from another. Culture is transmitted through language, uh, material objects, rituals, institutions, art, from one generation to the next. And there's more to it than that. And we'll get into it as we, as we engage each other and interactively here this evening. Heritage, the traditions, the achievements, and beliefs that are part of the history of a group of people. Uh, but we have to move culture in the context of looking for the opportunities to optimize the potential of cultural and heritage tourism. We have to move from the old paradigm where we saw the attractions in the Caribbean, for example, as being beach, sun, toes, food. Where primarily the hotels, the taxi drivers, uh, the tour guides, and the government collected the taxes, and the employees at the hotels, and the ones who, who chauffeur the cars are the ones who primarily benefited. And maybe this, the farmers, to some extent, where they utilize the local produce. But we have to go beyond that and embrace the paradigm in which we see our people, all of us, as stakeholders. The, 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 the farmers, the cooks, the, the craftsmen, the, the, the artists, the singers, the dancers, the athletes who brand and endorse products, the Usain Bolts, the Kiranis of the Caribbean, the managers, the accountants, the promoters, the organizers, all of them, plus others, we must embrace and find ways and means to, to involve in the process of managing and, and tapping into what we have as, as, as culture and heritage in all its forms, and it's all in, in all its manifestations. All right, thank you very much, sir. Now, <laughs> Shelley, um, you, you, this is where the rubber hits the road, because that's what you, you're doing, I mean. So the, the, the challenges, the expectations, the opportunities are your experiences in this whole culture presentation. When we say, when it is said here that you produce over 200 public programs, and of course with a cultural flair of the Caribbean, talk to us about that. It's appreciation and the challenges. Yeah, so, so back when we set out, um, just, just by way of background, my, before I was working um, on Caribbean exclusively, um, my background was in media and technology, so working for really large international corporations in strategic partnerships, Google, Time Warner, um, History Channel, in monetization and distribution. So really my vision was about how do we take Caribbean culture and package it, um, not only domestically or here in New York City, but how do we take that around the world. And using digital transmissions, digital, digital media technologies really was part of that vision. So. What we've been able to do, and the other thing is, I am a Caribbeanist, so I've traveled to over 30 Caribbean countries, some dozens of times I've played mass in the French Caribbean, in the English Caribbean, in Brooklyn, in Miami, so really having a wide scope of the region and sort of the different practices. And you know, being able to take that and package that um, up over and over again is extremely challenging. And I think part of it, a lot of it has to do with, there's this huge gap, right, between uh, we work a lot, for example, with the Brooklyn Museum, which is just down the road, and we're considered to be not their top Caribbean or partner of color, but their top partner of any kind, right? So we've gone to conferences to present best practices in cultural production and, and partnerships. And, but being able to take uh, different assets, whether it's from the Puerto Rican, the Haitian, the Trinidadian, the Jamaican, or even from Europe or from the Caribbean um, community, whether those communities live here in Brooklyn or sort of in the tri-state area is sometimes challenging, sometimes often challenging because you don't have necessarily 
uh, all of the financial support or the domestic, you know, the support from the home countries to help bring these assets here to the diaspora where you have 13,000 people um, engaging in Caribbean programming. I think another thing is, you know, there's just sort of like still this, this gap between generations that really needs to be be uh, bridged. So those are some of the things um, that we've been working on very actively for a number of years, um, but alas, we're still here and we're still um, in production. Okay, I want to toss two questions out to you and I'm going to leave it to you to decide, you know, who's more comfortable answering which question. But first I want to ask you, if you were to describe culture versus heritage to the layperson, how would you do it? There, there are two words that are used interchangeably and I would like you to explain how you differentiate between the two. That's number one. Number two, we're talking about pushing our culture, pushing our heritage, and one of the things we have been accused of is trying to Americanize or sanitize our very culture and our heritage. And I think Jamaica has been very successful in that. I, I like to consider Jamaica the French of the Caribbean. They're unapologetically Jamaican. This is what you, you come here, you find here, you take it. If you don't like it, you leave. And they've been successful at doing it. But as I was discussing this with Irwin earlier, he mentioned, it's very true, there's a risk to that. How do we strike the balance between staying true to ourselves and still offering a product that is saleable? I'll look at the second one. Okay, with regard to the second question, what you are really referring to is commodification of cultural and heritage tourism sites. They are in their raw form. They cannot be taken to the market as they are. As a result, they go through a process of transforming them to make them marketable. In other words, their authenticity is being changed so that they could generate revenue for the hotel, for the tourism site owners. However, that can be overdone. And when it is overdone, this is where we have tension and conflict between the property owners and the brokers of cultural and heritage tourism. Because the brokers would want to Americanize, as you say, the cultural and heritage tourism sites, changing it dramatically that it may not share the same kind of history. Because cultural and tourism, cultural heritage sites have to do with our history, who we were, what happened on those sites, what plantations, the artifacts, and we must do everything to protect those artifacts because that is who we are. However, we have challenging situations in terms of job creation, in terms of modernizing what we call our tourism products, and as a result, we may very well end up losing the authenticity of these products, who we are, and in the next 10, 15 years, Everything on the, in the Caribbean may not be authentic. It's something that you could find um, anywhere in the world, in America, in Florida. So we will not be able to differentiate ourselves from other tourism products globally. Amen to that. You, so, you know, just, just before you go to that, and, and that's a good, good, good point there. And I, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, and, I, and I was hoping there was a microphone I could pass to the folks in the front. Because as we celebrate World Environment Day today, I, 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 was, I would like to ask you, Riley, to address that as it relates to that whole connection and, and the possibility of, of our culture, heritage disappearing as it relates to monetizing it and presenting it for it to be marketable. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think what we're all seeking here is balance. We're trying to find that balance. There was, uh, I, I know many in the audience will remember a uh, professor uh, at the University of the West Indies. Professor Nurse? No, he, he was quite an exponent of culture and the arts and so on. Professor Rex Nettleford, the, 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 the late Professor Rex Nettleford, used to say that there is a fine line between cultural tourism and a touristic culture a fine line between cultural tourism and a touristic culture. 
and one of, I think what we're all saying is that cultural tourism is a good thing and it is one of the products that we offer because we all agree that sun, sea and sand are, are, are wonderful and they continue to be a major magnet to draw people to the Caribbean and they'll probably be for a very long time to come, but it's not the only thing. As people um, get more sophisticated and more worldly and so on, they've been there, done that, done the fly and flop thing, they come for an experience, which is really what we're talking about. But what they don't come for is an example, this is perhaps one of the most extreme and egregious examples that I can think of, is some years ago when one of our member countries discovered some petroglyphs etched in stone. These things were many uh, uh, tens of, of, of decades old, hundreds of years old actually. And someone very kindly, who spotted this, very kindly went with um, uh, with red paint on a brush and outlined them so that the tourist could see them. Ruined centuries of artifacts so that the tourists could see them. That person was confused about the difference between cultural tourism and he was creating a touristic culture. That is the kind of extreme example that you don't often see, but you need to understand it so that we will know what we cannot do. But without a doubt, there is this balance that we must strike. Cultural tourism is about authenticity, it is about who we are, and it is about ex it is an exponent of that hospitality that we talk about. There's no question that there's an inherent relationship between cultural tourism and hospitality. We invite people into our homes to see more of who we are and, and where we came from. We mustn't ever lose that authenticity though by taking red paint and outlining it so certain someone can more clearly understand us. So if I could just um, back to the, the second question about uh, cultural heritage and, and assets. Um, so I spent a, a long time, in, and of course we're, we're still actively working on this as we speak, so I think one of the, the things is we as an organization and as a platform are always uh, presenting Caribbean culture and heritage authentically. So it's really about curation, right? How do you actually extract different assets, assets from the community and present them to ourselves as well as to new audiences? And that's really what this is about. And really I think, you know, more and more as we're seeing the world opening up and a lot of, there's like a whole trend around black travel and young travelers, that's what they want. They want to actually have that insider or authentic experience. Right? So they want to come and play mass with us. They want to come and you know, go to the, the spaces that we're going to, not to just be on a resort where there's you know, just everything is sort of like packaged for them and it, it feels like you're almost you know, just not having an authentic experience without you know, getting too much in depth. So rather than going to Sandals, you know, they want to maybe be in, an, be in an Airbnb and you know, hanging out with their friends on the gaff and then playing mass in, in tribe or you know, whatever um, experience and, and really feel like they're embedded in, in uh, Caribbean culture. So eating street food, uh, you know, making sure that they're really up to date on all of the latest you know, soca tunes and reggae tunes and, and even you know, Haitian tunes, and that's really what it's about, right? But I think that there's still a huge opportunity, as you said, Hugh, um, in terms of education, um, particular, particularly back home. And, you know, there are a lot of assets here in the diaspora that can be leveraged um, to actually help fill that gap. So another great example, to, to your point, is I was a part of an ex excavation when I was in um, undergrad at Betty's Hope in Antigua, and got kicked out <laughs> of school because I asked the professors, why were they bringing the artifacts back home without asking the government? You just can't go into a country and take the artifacts without you know, having some kind of explicit permission. And I kind of saw what was happening and I was just like, wait a minute, like, is this really happening? So again, you know, I think that we have to, to be more engaged, even what's happening in, in our own backyards, right? Because this has been happening for a really, really long time, and you know, there has to be awareness, not only you know, at a government level, but also at a local level, so even you know, we're able to engage with 
tourists and newcomers that may be coming in, whether they're coming to engage in, in authentic cultural experiences or they're coming to sort of rip us off as, of our historic okay. <laughs> heritage sites. Thank you, Jerry. I want you to jump in and talk about, get, share your take on it and the difference between culture and heritage. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Owen was correct when he said that uh, the, the terms have been used interchangeably. Uh, uh, in term, in, in, as a matter of fact, it has become very elastic. Uh, in, in the context of the arts, for example, the use of the term culture relates to how a, a society's history, beliefs, values, traditions, and icons are manifested in the artistic format. Uh, the term often embraces indigenous and natural culture, depending upon the perspective of the proponent. Uh, for the purposes of tourism planning, uh, the following working definition are often employed, and, have adopt and I personally have adopted that. Uh, for example, heritage tourism. Uh, is seen as sustainable tourism activity that is or can be aligned to physical or intangible heritage. And much of the time, when we speak of heritage, we, 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 tend to, we, we age it. We, we, we think of something that may be mostly for, from, from a distant past that has been passed on. Um, and, and, and quite often, culture is, 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 it collapses on us. It's, it's, it's old and it's new. Because culture is static. It, it is evolving, always changing. So for example, I'm wearing a shirt jack today. And some of you might have assumed that I'm from Grenada and maybe Morris Bishop was a hero to me. <laughs> and it's a cultural thing for some of us from the Caribbean to wear shirt jacks, not only because it's warmer there, but also stylistically because it, it maybe it, it separates us a bit from the European style, which I also adopt. But we, we, it's about culture relates to, to lifestyle, you know, we dress, uh, what we eat, the way we dance, uh, gyration is not only about sex, it's, it's also about how we express ourselves based on other and historical fact, uh, factors. Uh, uh, let me just mention something. Physical heritage, for example, built structures and surrounds, cultural landscapes, historic sites, ruins, archaeological and maritime sites, physical heritage. Intangible heritage, oral traditions, languages, rituals and beliefs, social practices, knowledge, human activities, etc. And uh, cultural tourism now, we see generally, is a subset of, the tourism, of, of, of tourism that is concerned mostly with the traveler's uh, engagement, as our sister here was sharing, with the country or region's culture, the engagement, specifically the lifestyle of the people in those ge geographical areas, the history of those people, the art, etc. So for example, when you go, and I'll use Grenada as an example, uh, and they can, I can use another country too. In, in the case of Grenada, for example, the job experience, you know, we have even developed a sub-genre of soca, job soca, uh, an evolving thing. So foreigners come, the students at SGU, they enjoy it. They, they immerse themselves, they enjoy them, participate in that. Now, how do we monetize that? How do we, how do we capture that and, 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 and transform that into something where we can make money out of it? And the promoters do. The, the artists do when they get booked. Uh, and and even, 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 you know, we have forums where, and events where we cater especially for foreigners, where these people get sometimes paid more than they get when they perform before, before the locals. So there, there are ways to do it, and I have some examples, I'm gonna to get to that later, but I just wanted to mention some of these categories uh, in terms of how we can distinguish one from the other. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we, we don't have all nights here, unfortunately, at Medgar Evers. We'd love to stay in Brooklyn all night, but I, I mentioned when we started out the whole idea of how do we get the diaspora and the average man on the street, man or woman on the street, involved in this process. I, and I want us to take it there now because our culture and our heritage, as I said before, has been the platform for many to, to enjoy economically. And, and many who are at the root of it, or I can speak, for example, of the Maroons in Jamaica, for example, with significant culture and heritage and history, seem not to be able to, 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 to make the type of economic returns from what they're all about. But we see the others taking off. I want to throw this back to Wilson now. 
Yes, first of all, we No, 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 I didn't tell you what I was about. <laughs> I, I know you have a long dissertation on this. This is a man who knows about this thing, etc. The person, Wilson, in the diaspora, mm -hmm. who is now looking to build out their experiences in this whole tourism conundrum that is just taking off and leaving us behind. Mm -hmm. Heritage tourism seems to be something that we can still, we still have a hold to. How do we make money from it? Let's get real now. Let's let, put the rubber to the road here now. Uh, do, are we talking about public, 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 private, entrepreneur? Talk to us about that. Well, first of all, there must be an educational process before we can even move forward. And through that process, we will understand who the cultural tourists are because we do not want to waste time marketing to everyone. Secondly, we have to ask ourselves what is in it for us. Now, the Caribbean relies heavily on remittances. If we can engage in the development of cultural and heritage tourism, create greater prosperity back at home, then there will not be the need for us to be sending as much remittances to our family as, as we are currently doing. So in other words, you ask the Caribbean person what is in it for them. One, they will have more economic resources which they can now divert to serious investments instead of sending it back home strictly for consumer purposes. Once we have gotten over that bridge, because the cultural and heritage tourism owners are some of the most difficult to educate. Once we have gotten over that bridge, now we have to create marketing vehicles. We are talkers, Caribbean people. There are no smooth talkers than any other Caribbean person. We have been doing it for decades. We have been sending people back home. But how can we do it in a formalized fashion whereby it can be measurable? You know that you know, we have sent X number to the Caribbean to visit cultural and heritage tourism. What mechanism can we put in place in order for us to be able to measure and identify the market interest of our people in the, in, in the diaspora? And thirdly, in terms of investments, we are, there are cultural and heritage tourism brokers out there pushing our cultural and heritage tourism sites away from us. How do we now focus on going back home and telling grandma, grandpa, you know, that thing you have there is not bush, you know. That's a serious heritage tourism site you have there. That could turn out to end all the poverty that has been in our generations for life. But no, we have them been listed out, we have them been taken over. But we have to be realistic because by under commercializing them, they turn out to be non profitable, put stress on the family. So we need to get a professional approach towards the development of cultural and heritage tourism. Thank you. Uh, okay. hold, hold a point because you, you said we're smooth talkers and I don't want to, you to, 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 to make it real here tonight that we are truly smooth talkers. I, I want to bring in a minister, the minister uh, of, of tourism and information broadcasting from St. Lucia, Honorable Dominic Fidi. Just to ask him, um, um, where, where does government factor into this whole situation? How do we now um, get, get government to either put in the infrastructure to encourage this whole process? Because this can't happen without the participation of, of government, one way or another. Talk to us. Well, I'm very pleased that CTR is organizing this because I think for a long time, sorry, uh, I think for a long time the Caribbean has been so addicted to um, the sun, sand, and the sea phenomenon. So it's really, really good to see. And I think that what's driving this is the market. The market is saying that people are looking for new experiences and therefore the Caribbean, uh, we are forced to somehow come up with new opportunities for people to come to our country. And so our heritage is now being sought after and we are looking at this opportunity. But to answer your question more specifically, I think that first there must be a pre an appreciation by the various governments that uh, culture and heritage tourism they do have a significant role to play. In our own experience in St. Lucia, we are now, we have just allocated significant sums in our budget to develop our villages. So I have the good fortune of being the first minister to preside over a village tourism project. We're really going into a 
Thank you. Where we will be going into focusing on eight of our strongest villages and leverage very potently their cultural assets to see how best we can uh, bring them about. I'm, I've been very disappointed in how we have sold ourselves to the world. And I think that sometimes um, what happens is that we don't believe in ourselves as Caribbean people. Um, I was quite pleased when I went to Trinidad and I had the experience to visit the Carnival Mass Camp. And I thought to myself, to myself, why don't we, for example, reproduce the carnival experience every day in the year? Why, why don't we think that um, you know, many carnivals in our respective jurisdictions would add value to the tourism experience of all of our visitors? Uh, and so I think that it is governments that have to um, ensure that we project uh, cultural and heritage tourism policy. Um, we must be very deliberate in ensuring not just um, the traditional uh, tourism segments, but we must ensure that culture and heritage is at the forefront. I want to mention Fordham Plantation. It's owned by uh, a St. Lucian man uh, who, who actually uh, took over his father's estate. And his story is, is that everyone thought that he was mad when he went into Castries, the capital, and bought all of these chapel houses. And some of these houses are uh, 75 years old. And he bought them and brought them back into a cocoa plantation uh, to the south of the island, the southwestern corner of the island called Sufre. And what he did was he actually restored them and elevated them and built villas. And then Prince Charles and Camilla came and stayed at his uh, estate. And then everyone appreciated the value of cultural tourism. His price went from the floor to the roof. And that is an experience of, uh, that is an, an example of how potent and strong the culture of the Caribbean can generate significant sums to the tourism industry, to the economies of the region. And I think that we're on the right track. Today is a great opportunity um, for us to stimulate this rather important subsector. Sub so, well done, you. All right. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Marshall, one of the things we cannot leave here tonight, Marshall, and, and not make sure that this becomes part of the dialogue. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I am old. <laughs> and you are like, what? Millennia? I am, I'm not quite a millennial. I, I, Outer, Whatever, outer young, outer young people, young people. <laughs> we have to make sure that our younger generation is part of this. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, we need to engage Shelly and ask her, what's really going on there? What, what do you hear is happening out there? How are young people from Caribbean stock dealing with culture and heritage apart from the music and food? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So there's definitely carnival and music, I would say, is that a common denominator. And one of the trends that we're seeing is that we're moving in, in groups, right? And so you're seeing also that people are curating experiences. And people have asked me, particularly in the last year, why isn't Caribbean doing a trip? And I want to go to the Caribbean with you, Shelley, and with Caribbean to like really experience authentic Caribbean culture. Like, where are you lining? Where are you eating? What are you doing while you're in the Caribbean? And there are lots of shops that are coming up that are like that. So one of the things, just to your point earlier, that I think that we can do is also look to tastemakers, influencers, um, whether they're younger or older, right? Because there's a myriad of experiences out there and see, okay, how are we gonna create a dance hall experience? How are we gonna create a carnival experience? And how are we gonna create a culinary experience? I mean, there are, we can come up with dozens and dozens of experiences, but who is gonna curate that? And who are the influencers who can actually aggregate a group of people and also take that online and be able to share that experience with the world so that when they're on that trip, they're sharing and hashtagging and, you know, at CTO or, you know, Caribbean Week. And they're, they're saying, look, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm eating. This is what I'm experiencing. This is cool. And by default, like a huge, a huge hashtag on Instagram is Caribbean life. Right? I mean, it's huge. You guys take out your phones, go to Instagram, just search Caribbean life, and you'll see there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of posts. Right? So how can we leverage those assets 
and really start to attract um, younger audiences because that's what people want. People want to connect and be in these groups of people who are influential and who are going to take them on a particular path. And they may go off on their own, uh, but I think that that's a huge opportunity um, that is that we can actually um, capitalize on in the near future. Another, sorry, another hashtag I want to encourage you to use because I really believe in being strong, loud, and proud about who we are, and that is, I grew up where you vacation. I absolutely love that hashtag. Now, I just want to jump on the back, and you know, one of you guys can, you can follow up with what you were going to say, but I do think it might tie into what I'm about to mention. And you mentioned earlier, um, about the brokers who are marketing our product away from us. And I met with a really um, interesting group of people here in New York. They formed an organization called visit.org. They're alumni from Columbia, and right now they're fast becoming the largest sustainable booking site. And when you hear millennials and millennials talk about travel, the buzzword is responsible travel. They want to travel responsibly. They're very conscious about where their dollars are being spent, and they're demanding that their dollars go back into the community. And that's what visit.org is focused on. And they don't have a large presence in the Caribbean, and they've asked me to partner with them to find tours and um, organizations that they can send people to in various Caribbean destinations. And I want to hear from you how we can work with these individuals because their offering is a smaller offering. And we find that the big hotels and so on, they're looked after very well. But the individuals, that person, that school that may have a kitchen garden, you know, and there is the tourist who wants to visit that school, they want to participate in that with the students, they want to ensure that they buy those vegetables and that money goes back into the community. Those people may not necessarily be getting the marketing and the publicity that they need. So how do we begin to make them more visible so that a visit.org can start marketing them and getting these millennials and other tourists who are interested in traveling responsibly to these places that are otherwise unseen? Um, I would say train them and put them online, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. So, you know, if they're ready to, if you're going to have them receiving international tourists, make sure that they have the training that they need and that they're actually able to monetize, whether that's accepting credit card payments or they have the service levels or the accommodations um, or the certifications that they need in order to accept international visitors. And then I would say the second step is just put them online, right? Yeah. So someone needs to be, you know, at a country level or at a local level, be aggregating those assets and then putting them online. And then also making sure that they're equipped to do their own social media and digital marketing. We have a question in the Greetings, everyone. Greetings. I'd like to commend uh, the uh, Caribbean Tourism Board for having this forum. So those of us little people in the community can come and voice our concerns. I personally don't think there is a Caribbean culture. There is an African culture in the Caribbean. There's a Chinese culture. There are white folks culture. There's an Indian culture. There are different cultures. I, as a youngster, as an old man, grew up in the Caribbean, and I've seen how these different groups, how they operate around their culture. We, as, Ms. As, as the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey once said to us, that a people without the knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. We cannot run around this place trying to be a part of everybody else's culture and ignoring the African culture. Amen. When we talk about culture, Amen. heritage, and culture in the Caribbean, everybody wants to forget the African part of our, our history and our culture. Amen. Why is that so? Amen. We, are, we are trying to reach out and, uh, to the world to come to our country. When I was a youngster growing up, I used to think that tourism is something that other people come to your country to learn about your history, to learn about who you are, to go away enriched 
and understanding that there is another group of people out there besides you. Instead, we have created, we are, we are morphed into a hybrid kind of African people. We don't want to be considered African. And we want to embrace everybody else's culture but our own. And so, others, it's easy for us to come in the, others to come in the Caribbean and impose their culture upon us. And this is why we don't know who we are. And if the Europeans have come to the Caribbean and they have instilled and passed on their kind of uh, European culture upon us. It is not the African way. I have no problem with other groups of people embracing their culture. But why are we running from the African culture? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And lastly, 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 I want to know this. Somebody from St. Lucia can tell me this, I hope. Some years ago, I was right here at an all-day conference on tourism. And the main, the, 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 uh, the main speaker at the time was Alan Chastanet from St. Lucia. He was just a businessman at the time. And he spent most of his time trying to, uh, 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 how should I put it? Trying to sell us on all right. <laughs> Homosexual tourism. Huh? All right, he tried to sell us on that. And uh, I challenged him and I told him that that is not the Caribbean's way of life. That's not our culture. But he told us that these folks have money to spend. And when they come to our country, we must treat them nice, we must be respectful, and they'll spend on. I mean, is it about money? What about. I mean, our souls. We're selling our souls and selling our children. All right. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much. So I want to know if St. Lucia, now that Alan Chastanet is Prime Minister of St. Lucia, and he has the power to instill that on the people, is that the policy of St. Lucia now to legalize that kind of lifestyle in St. Lucia? All right. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, thank you very much, Jose. I will keep up right. I don't trust this thing. We're back on the plantation and we are, it's my family. Okay. Because he just cut off funding to San Lucia National Heritage Trust. All right. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you right now. That's where he was coming from. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So the question has been answered. Let, let's move on here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Caribbean culture is a term that explains the artistic, musical, literary, culinary, political, and social elements that are representative of the Caribbean people all over the world. The Caribbean's culture has historically been influenced by that of African, European, Amerindian, and other Asian traditions. Uh, I don't for one minute believe that our panelists or anyone here think that we are running away from whom we are. Jerry. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I wanted to respond to that, to say that. I mean, the brother does have a point. We, we have to admit who we are and know who we are, but at the same time, we also have to be factual about it and scientific about it and admit that it's a melting pot. And what we have in the Caribbean is a confluence of different influences that have, that have resulted in what we have, which we call our own culture. And, and we have to respect that and accept that. But that doesn't mean that one is superior to the other. You know, we, 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 we have to approach it in a way where we, we build on what we have. And again, as I said earlier, Culture is it, it, it is dynamic. It is not something that's static. It's not dead. It's alive and it's happening and it's evolving. Uh, in, in terms of the public responsibilities, I think the, our governments. I see government as an en enabler, as a facilitator in this whole process. And in terms of the understanding, we are talking about what we should do with our young people to get them ready for this. I think it goes to training opportunities for locals in areas that enable growth and develop, development of, of money making projects and industries. And government should prioritize uh, school curricula at all levels and in, in, in include in there a, a learning, a, a teaching, education that would enable us and prepare us to take advantage of the things which make us unique as a people. Uh, also, uh, also, I think that uh, the government should have a special basic training for tour guides, uh, touch on the historical facts, the landmarks, or tour guides should be prepared to deal with you know, to, to know what we have and where we have it, so that when, our, when tourists visit, they know where to take them and how to explain what it is we have as a people and as a culture. 
I, I think our governments could, could do much more in, in, in those areas. I, I think we also need legislative protection of heritage sites. Uh, we, we need laws that protect those sites. Uh, for example, when it happens with somewhat a private, uh, an estate that has, like for example, you know, we have something called the, uh, the uh, where, where slaves, the slave pen, where slaves were sold and kept. Uh, it's on someone's private estate. I think the law should be passed so that sites such as that one would be maintained and preserved and protected so that we, 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 we know what it is and we teach our children what it is. And, and also, when, when tourists come, if they want to go to see that site, there should be a fee. You know, we, we, the forts and, and all the other sites, we need to do more, in, and the government has a part to play in that. We also need to encourage promoters and artists to stage festivals year-round, not just at carnival time, not just at independence time, year-round, because especially during the seasons when the tourists are visiting, uh, during the win wintry months. Uh, that, that has, there has to be a policy. Someone mentioned policy. We need a heritage, a cultural heritage tourism policy. All of our countries should have that. We also need to see uh, more uh, markets for cultural products and heritage products worldwide. And our governments should help in facilitating and enabling that so that we have the markets and then on the private sector, we need people to come forward in the diaspora and back home as exporters back home and as importers up here to import these products, these cultural and heritage products, market those, distribute those wholesale, and retail those wholesale as well. And those are low-hanging fruits. We're talking about how we can monet, you know, make some money out of this, how we can benefit and empower ourselves with this. We need to find markets, and those of us who are here, not just go home and buy something and bring it up when we come. Why not open a store and sell some of it here? Why not find ways to do it online? You know, so there, there, we, there, there's a lot more we can do back home and here to, to really make this, you know, add some, 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 some un, uh, entrepreneurial uh, opportunities to the whole thing. And I see. Stop right there, Jerry. Stop right there. Wilson, yeah. you, heard what, you heard what Jerry just said, right? Yeah. How, serious are, how serious are our folks back home about our forays into investing and forming partnerships to make some of these things work? Because whenever I hear government, it kinda, I kind of get nervous there. Uh, government for me, infrastructure. Don't get involved in the money side of the things because it's not going to work. And, 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 and these things are great, but they have to be, they have, we have to find some way to sustain them. So get real here now, Wilson. Go, they're really serious about us participating. Well, anytime I hear the word government, I get a chill, you know. So that's why I believe we now have to move away from. That but Wilson, some of them are my friends, all right? Yeah, they are my friends. friends. All of them are. Okay. I think there is the issue of trust, which we have to overcome. There is also the lack of the absence of a legacy, an historical legacy, where we can see for the last twenty years. George and Brown started off a project and it has grown to this proportion. So we do not have that historical background on which we can rely on. Secondly, there is that fear of failure and failure should be looked upon as a way of growing up, as a way of developing. But I have done a lot of work in terms of gems of the Caribbean and gems of St. Lucia, even gems of Africa. And I am seeing the need out of fear for us to start getting together now to own and control some of the resources back home. I think fear now, we have certain agitation in St. Lucia right now because of the fear of certain people feeling that they will be displaced as a result of an economic development. So I think we have reached that point now, thousands were demonstrating on one end, thousands were demonstrating on the other end. So there's a new consciousness now among, I think the millennials are taking control of the resources to ensure that we now form ourselves into viable economic um, entities. And I would look again as for the support of um, um, CTO to move, help us move forward. They have given us a lot of support to um, tangibilize some of these assets like gems of the Caribbean where we bring all the cultural and heritage sites together under one umbrella and market them as a product so that those that the owners who do not have the financial capacity 
or intellectual capacity will find support from us. Thank you so much. It. We want to talk to someone in the audience. And you have a question for us? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before you guys tonight. Um, and I hope that uh, we can have a forum like this on many more occasions. Can I ask you to speak into the mic? We're not hearing you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, can, I'd like for us to do this more often, so to speak. Um, my question is, why is it so, well, I have done business in the Caribbean. I've been doing it for the last 15 years or so. And I have found that every time I attempt to do something, I get more resistance from the locals there. And this is even governments. Why is there so, so much resistance from them, even though the business is registered in the country. So the benefits of the rewards of the business is going directly back to the country. Why is there so much resistance? I mean, I have tried many initiatives in the Caribbean and I have virtually almost given up. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, I think part of the reason why this is so, again, is because of the lack of education. If we, if we are teaching, uh, I mean, nurturing our minds from an early age at uh, the value of what we have and how we can use it and, and without selling ourselves out and maintaining control of it in a, in a well-managed way, then there will be less fear. I, I think that there are ways to deal with that, but it wouldn't happen overnight. I do not think it's education. I think we now have the most brilliant generation we've ever had in this country. All right, thank you very much. One last question from the audience. We have an 8.30 deadline. Okay, I'm gonna make it quick and fast. I'm gonna make it quick and fast because having returned home now, I was part of the diaspora, but I'm back home now in Anguilla. And I think there may be like a disconnect because there is actually, I've attended meetings with OECS and they go from island to island to island and they're working with the youth. So I, all I can say is everybody go home and, and set up shop and just begin to get involved in what's going on on the island because I'm really sitting there and I'm like, there is a disconnect. All right, all right. Thank you much. All right. Show to Tulsa. Go ahead. Yes. Um, Thank you, everybody, for this is um, very important to me. Um, there's a certain apathy within um, our community. You know, there's a disconnect, like you're saying, the old, and you have to teach your kids from young. And right now, we have a lot of um, globalization. That's the fear right now. And globalization is just not New York. It has impacted the Caribbean community in New York hard, and now it's reaching the, um, the islands, so forth. So I think the, the number one thing we want to do is get the younger youths and still also with the older generation, pass on the knowledge, yes. the investment, and just get off, you know, just stop the ap 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 apathy. Okay. That's just apathy right now within thank, the community. Thank you very much. And I have to apologize. We are, we are pressed one, for time. We, we are pressed for time. One question? One question. Ten seconds. What has CTO done during this Caribbean week to support Caribbean businesses in Brooklyn? All right. And that's my question. Let me answer this question. Yeah, sure. Well, part of it is why we're here, and we can dialogue with that, but I'm quite certain that this is a challenge that we take to our respective concerts and respective Caribbean governments as to how they invest in the, in the, in the diaspora, because it has been almost a philanthropic process where it goes one way. It's about investing in the diaspora so that benefits can flow back to the respective nations. We have to wrap now. I'm going to ask my panelists, and I apologize, but a 30, second, 30 seconds each. I start with you, Jerry, as we wrap. Well, I'm happy that we had this opportunity to discuss it tonight. We really want to, you know, just touch the surface. What's the answer uh, there, is to my the, there, there, there is much more. I, 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 um, we have. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold, hold. Yes, it will be. Could you bear with us a minute? I'll ask the representative from CTO to answer. Yeah, I will leave it to CTO to do that. Yes. Uh, but I, I, I would say it's important that we recognize what we have as a people and take responsibility, all of us as stakeholders, and not just leave it to government. The private sector has its, its part to play, and not just the folks back home. Yes, there can be exporters, there can be manufacturers, there can be uh, creators of, of what we have, but we here too must embrace that, and Thank import, you. and distribute, and sell, and target not just ourselves, but those who are non-Caribbean American as well. Thank Especially you very much. Thank you very much, Jerry. Wilson. The time is now. Thank you. All right, Shelly. 
Yeah, so for me, I would say there's a huge opportunity to, to bridge the gap uh, between the generations. And we not only do we have a lot of cultural and heritage assets, we have a lot of human assets. And there are lots of experts that are working in a number of fields and who are really committed to... You're the uh, director? Yes, I am. Of Caribbean Tourism Organization. Now this year um, has been a really, so far, from what I've seen, it's been a really fabulous week. Now, from your point of view, as an insider, um, how has this week really accomplished what you plan to, uh, you know, well, the objective, the objective of Caribbean Week is to ensure that our member countries benefit from the things that we do in New York for Caribbean Week. Eh? And I have not he heard any feedback yet that anybody has been dissatisfied with anything that we've done, so I would venture to say that we've accomplished the objective we set out to. And what was one of the objectives that you wanted to accomplish? To showcase the Caribbean, to provide opportunities for member countries to meet and interact with the media and tell their stories so that the media writes it the way the members want it told. Now, uh, attending uh, your Monday night uh, event, uh, it seems that culture seems to be one of the things that they're projecting uh, for the future for uh, the Caribbean islands. Um, we do have to say about that. Well, there's a trend toward cultural tourism. The culture in the Caribbean is probably the most exciting anywhere. And um, visitors today are interested in immersing themselves in the cultural experiences of the destinations that they visit. So it was appropriate for us to talk with our diaspora about how they can contribute, even in this marketplace, to promoting Caribbean culture and um, finding ways to benefit financially from culture. So, um, did, did that come from the uh, consumer or is that coming from the inside? Outside? Well, that, that culture is something that they want to, to experience more. Well, it's a trend and, and um, our members are up on the trends. Um, we know that consumers are looking for cultural experiences. We know heritage tourism is important to them. And uh, the diaspora understands how important that is to them as well. So it's, both, it's a collision of both worlds. Now, um, tomorrow's Friday night. It's a big event. Yes. I've attended a few of them. Yes. And um, it is very interesting to see the uh, layout of all the islands being participating with their top chefs and all of the rums from the island. What is the uh, main focus of the rum rhythm? Well, from your point of view, that's my point of view. <laughs> the, mo the objective of Ramen Rhythm is to raise funds for the CTO Foundation. But the Caribbean is so colorful in its music, its history, its food, its culture. Why not use that uh, to help raise funds to educate Caribbean nationals to study tourism and hospitality and keep the industry alive and vibrant? So, from our point of view, Rum and Rhythm culminates Caribbean Week, uh, but it's, it's, it is not just a party, it's a party with a cause. It's an opportunity for us to promote the award-winning rums of the Caribbean, to showcase the culinary expertise and excellence of our chefs in the Caribbean, um, to showcase unusual music coming from the Caribbean, and enjoy a good time, not just with the Caribbean diaspora, but young professionals and other dem um, demographics that can take a Caribbean vacation. Now, uh, now when you talk about the culture, and, um, can you name some of the culture that might be exhibited tomorrow night? In addition to the food and the music and the you know, rum, is there any other uh, features that we might be... Well, there are surprises. The committee would probably not want me to name some of the events, but one we have promoted is Xavier Strings. They're young um, musicians from Trinidad and Tobago, and they perform soca and calypso and reggae and blues, a wide repertoire of music uh, on a violin. So that is something that we're all very excited about um, experiencing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything else now? Um, CTO is, like I say, you know, exposing the culture of the Caribbean islands. Right. Um, how long is this? No, 
I mean, um, the theme of the event, Caribbean Week, is where business and culture collide. Um, but Caribbean, this is the 45th year that the Caribbean Tourism Organization has been holding a Caribbean Week in New York. It's evolved over the years. Once upon a time, it was a, it ended with a huge black tie gala event at which we recognized the cultural icons and musical icons and people who'd made significant contributions to the development of tourism. Um, we've, we're looking at having a black tie gala again. That's something that we plan to reinstitute down the road. But in the meantime, we thought that we would focus on the rums, which is just such a critical part of the, the product. Um, focus on the rums and the music and the culture and have our um, Caribbean lovers and friends of the Caribbean and Caribbean diaspora have a good time. I think um, you know, the rum and rhythm is such a unique and really a wonderful experience that um, I hope that um, in the future more islanders and also island lovers will, will, will come and experience this one night of going from Jamaica, Bahamas, Turks and Caicos. Yeah, I think it's wonderful and uh, I know it's a wonderful idea and I hope that you do not substitute that for the black tie? Well, no, because the idea is not to substitute anything for the black tie because we think both of them can can happen um, during Caribbean week. Um, and if not during Caribbean week, they can both happen in the marketplace. But I want to thank people like you for getting the word out to your audiences so that they can come out and support us. Yes, I think that um, I'll give uh, Dem Bahamians, we'll give uh, your yeah, organization, the, Baham the Caribbean Tourism Organization, and your yeah, Caribbean Week, uh, the, the 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 most that we can give, uh, so that um, a lot of Caribbean and uh, Caribbean lovers come and experience this week. I, I find that it's a infusion of all the islands under one roof, and uh, you know what a better way to um, at least feel it before you get there. Absolutely, okay. that's what this is. Get a taste of the Caribbean and then go and experience a real thing. Uh, that's what rum and rhythm is about. Um, it has been a pleasure, Selma, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very and, much. Uh, by the way, uh, the scholarship, is this a non-profit organization? Yes, the, the scholarships are offered by the Caribbean Tourism Organization, which is a 501c3. And um, we've offered about a million dollars worth of scholarships to students from across the Caribbean who are interested in studying tourism and hospitality and languages. And um, I have to put a plug in for the excellent students that we offer scholarships to. The great demand for the scholarship and the unfortunate lack of funds that the foundation has. So this is an appeal to your audience to make a contribution to the Caribbean Tourism Organization Foundation. We really need it. We have lots of students who we have to say no to, not because they're not worthy candidates, but because they're not sufficient funds to offer as many scholarships as, demand, as are demanded. Okay, I thank you and I hope that uh, my audience um, can appreciate what you're doing and um, support your foundation. It's a non-profit organization and uh, it's tax deductible. And I'm sure that, um, you know, they'll be happy to, those who can afford will give generously. And those who can afford will give at least $5. How's That's that? That's five, every okay. dollar helps. And every dollar that the foundation raises goes towards scholarships. None of it goes toward overhead. We put our time in, CTO covers all of the overhead expenses because every single penny that the foundation raises goes to scholarships. So just one last thing, it's the end of 2017, tomorrow night is Rum and Rhythm, but your audience um, should stay tuned for Caribbean Week 2018, which is happening again the first week of June, June the week of June 4th, and Rum and Rhythm will be on that Friday night. And one other thing we've got is some real performances. And, and we wanted to, to, to focus and feature the diversity of the CTO. So we've got a performance coming up any moment now from Danza Fiesta from Puerto Rico. And the other thing we've got is some real performances. And, and we wanted to, to, to focus and feature the diversity of the CTO. So 
We've got a performance coming up any moment now from Danza Fiesta from Puerto Rico. And a little later this evening, you will also hear from La Troupe Zetoile of Haiti. So we've got the Spanish Caribbean members of CTO, the French Caribbean members of CTO, and we've got a lot of English speaking people here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Danza Fiesta of Puerto Rico.
Hand fingers up. The whole band, please. Uh -huh. Sweet. So now we have a beautiful plena. It's called bonbon de plena. Popurri de plena. Sweet, sweet. One, two. Test. Uh huh. Sweet. Test. Sweet. All right. Sweet.
saying? I am Puerto Rican. And tonight, all of you are Puerto Ricans. Because all of you are going to stand up with us and are going to dance plena with the sound bailada. El que dice que es puertorriqueño por allá por lejanas tierras lo tiene que demostrar bailando bueno la plena.
So with you, danza fiesta, el fuego fuego, danza fiesta.